Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 79, How to Build an Elite Hockey Player. Part 2, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we head over to the assembly line, continue building us a hockey player and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, then I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Barry Karn and I's lives parallel each other in so many ways, as I mentioned in the intro from part one. And one of those ways is he also has a long list of players that have gone on to or are continuing to do great things as well. So logically, it made sense to partner with him on this podcast, combining our lifetime of hockey experiences, and see if we can help you continue to build an elite hockey player. So ladies and gentlemen, Please help me in welcoming back Barry Karn to the show. Mr. Karn, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Thanks, lads. I always look forward to this. This is going to be fun. I, I, we, we got so deep into it last time. It was, uh, I, I, what did we make it? About three-fourths of the way through and probably could have gone even less with all the information we had there. Yeah, we're no spring fun. chickens, so these podcasters that are doing three-hour episodes, uh, unless there's wine involved, I, I'm out. <laughs> yes okay exactly. so first thanks again for taking the time uh there's been about maybe six days since the the last episode that we were thinking about some things and we're going to do the second episode so not going to waste any time uh with any more intro we're just going to jump right back into it but before we do let's just do a quick review of what we covered in part one uh basically it's a timeline for building an elite hockey player. We talked about location, where you are is important, and when you are going to uh, make your hockey player, or po potential hockey player, uh, try to time it in the first three months of the year if you can. Uh, there's scientific evidence that says that would be a good move to make. Uh, then from birth, uh, let's say around year three, uh, introducing the sport to them, and what does that mean? We talked about watching on TV, going to hockey games, and knee hockey. Anything else you want to add there? Yeah, just like you know, running around the house with your stick and ball, just playing. Too, well, right? you introduced a concept that uh, I, I don't know if I've heard of it before, but disagreeable training. Uh, and I remember, remember you talking about oh, yes, uh, your yes. kids and throwing the ball and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, we're going to start doing that stuff and, you know, making them reach a little more than they want to, because as a infant, they don't know what the heck's going on. Yeah. And I think every kid, every, every kid is prepared to take a different size step and you just have to kind of pay attention. I mean, if they're, if they're taking the steps, it's the right size. <laughs> just put it, put it that way. If they have some enthusiasm about it, I think they're taking the right size yeah. steps towards it. So, yeah, I think, yeah, the disagreeable training, I think, is it's paramount for later on in life when the kids are, you know, when when everything isn't just fun anymore. And there has to be there has to be that uphill climb once in a while to achieve something that isn't necessarily, you know, right. tasteful. It's one of those things that just it just doesn't feel right to them at first. It feels too hard. It's frustrating. And trying to get over those steps, you know, having some training to to be able to pull off some things that uh, aren't necessarily 
uh, you know, your favorite thing. You don't feel happy doing them right now, but you know they're the right thing and you have to do it. And and I think that just really sets them up for being able to pull that off right. later and in life. Obviously, when you're a when you're a younger sibling, you know, if you got two or three kids in a family, the, those younger siblings kind of get that automatically because they're always trying to keep up with a big brother or sister, you know. Sure. So you know, if you're exactly trying to build an elite hockey player, you know, throw more into the bucket. You'll get one, maybe. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that little that little brother at the table starts chewing a little faster so he can get some more. He's going to be your best takeaway yeah. player later on. It. All life. right. So then, where <laughs> there's there's a little bit of an interest uh, playing knee <clears throat> hockey and stuff. So we're going to start thinking about bringing them to the ice. Before that happens, uh, get them used to the skates off the ice. You know, your knee hockey time that you do, spend some time with the skates on, put some tape on the bottom so you're not cutting up your carpet. Uh, and then going to the ice, what I did is, you know, the first couple times was just let them go there in tennis shoes. If they didn't want to put on the skates, let's just go on the ice. And then uh, if you can get them out there walking around a little bit, but then the following step is to find someone like you. And uh, you you got 40 years in the business. Let me ask you this. For parents out there that don't have a hockey background, you know, hockey is a <clears throat> unique sport, uh, one of the unique sports <clears throat> out there because it's where a sport where you have to learn a skill before you can play the game, and that skill is skating. Uh, the hockey that you see on yeah. TV is, is something, you know, parents just getting into this and the kid, you're not going to see that for many years. So my question, uh, I know we both agree that when a kid is just starting out, there isn't a stick involved. When's the point in time when you say, okay, it's time to give this kid a stick? <clears throat> you know, that's a, that's kind of an interesting thing because uh, even with my wife who runs our little Karn Jr. program and we have little three-year-olds out there, their first lesson, they actually really? have stick with them. Um, they bring, they, they do bring it the first time they don't have it when they first walk out on the ice, but we actually introduce a puck with them the wow. first time too. Cause one of the things that happens is, uh, you know, the kids will get out there and they walk around on the ice a little bit and it's so foreign and there, you know, there's some anxiety involved with them. Uh, just not knowing whether they're even going to stand up or whether they're going to yeah. die, <laughs> you know, from it or not. And so I think sometimes this, the stick ends up being a good, uh, distraction for them. So, and they don't really even have to move. So they'll, they'll be in a, in a position where, you know, we talked about the little duck walk, you know, kind of rocking back and forth with your toes out and, and they just start moving forward naturally. And you can put kids like say down on the end in a goal line and see if they can dribble a puck back and forth across the goal line. And it's the smallest little possible movement you can, but it's, it, it just gives them a little bit of the, uh, a, a kind of a break from their feet a little bit about paying attention to just standing up. And then, you know, I know Jody goes back and forth and she'll have them hold their sticks over the top of their heads, which gives them absolutely erect posture, um, which seems counterintuitive to hockey, but from the balance standpoint, keeping your center of gravity over the top of your skates, they'll hold their stick up over the tops of their heads and, and do a little walking around like that. And they'll put the stick down. Sometimes they'll drop it, you know, and, you know, put it on the wall and do things with their hands. And yeah, it's just, uh, it, I, I like going back and forth like that. And, and especially for, you know, little kids who have some older brothers and sisters that already play hockey, when they go to skating lessons, they want to know they're going to hockey. Okay. So they actually have equipment on, shin pads, elbow pads, gloves, helmets, and, uh, and they have their stick. So we, we actually do start with all of that right away. Sometimes throwing everything on like, uh, you know, hockey pants and all and shoulder pads and all that. It's just, it's just too much for their own movement. 
and, you know, just some volleyball knee pads and some elbow pads or something like that. I mean, basically pads for young kids, they're really yeah. just for crashing. It's not like they're going to get hit or hit with pucks or anything like that, or even sticks hard enough to hurt them. So it's just for crashing. So yeah, that's, I, I, I actually like them to actually bring their stick, you know, a little bit, but it's, when you work with skating with little kids, you really have to keep skating and stick handling separate. Like I was, uh, like a take a, this is a, an example of me when I was 13 years old, I was six feet tall and, you know, super skinny, not very strong. I grew like, I think five inches that year and went through three pairs of skates. I thought my dad was going to kill me in the middle of the night sometime. Cause I was costing him so much money. Right. You know, oh, my stick's too short. My shin pads are too short. I like went through a couple sets of equipment and skates all in that year. And I was so skinny and weak. And, and this principle of that's an extreme, but this principle really affects all but about what I've seen, one in 10,000 kids, right? They don't have <clears throat> super strong legs. And we tell our kids to, you know, cut the stick off at your chin, cut the stick off at your mouth, cut it off at your nose, wherever everybody's got a different opinion where that is. And so the kid's standing there. And when he puts his stick on the ice, he can't bend his knees to do it. So they bow forward. And almost every problem in hockey, uh, in, in skating for a hockey player is now being uh, introduced. Every problem. First of all, you're bowed forward. You've cut your biomechanical strength, you know, down by about two thirds. Okay. You can't react. You can't do anything. You can't glide, which is ultimately the modern skater is the guy who can stay on glide. He's not doing anything to slow himself down. Um, so you're getting away from them staying centered over the flat of their blades where they can uh, skate around smoothly. So yeah, we do have to get rid of the stick or not use it and uh or or just hold on to it with one hand which drives some young coaches aren't you supposed to have two <laughs> hands on your stick all the time it's like yes no yeah. <laughs> yes and no there's reasons for having it do you know two hands in one hand and you understand that part too and it's like so so yeah you have to get kids to be balanced with the knee bend that they have given for them and then once they establish a little bit of skating like that you know, and we still go back and forth. And it's like, you know, it, it's literally like, hey, we're going to work on skating for three and a half minutes. And we're going to go over here and tap the puck back and forth across this line. Then we're going to go back over here and try this other thing with skating. We're going to go back over here and we're going to wrap some pucks around some little marker dots on the on the ice and things like that. And you keep going back and forth. And as the kids learn how to skate, eventually you can appeal to, you know, how you were balancing really well without the stick. Well, now we have to try and balance with the stick and you're introducing a little bit more knee bend and everything, which they really can't handle as much knee bend as they, they need to have, but you're introducing it and you're doing it for super short periods of time. Like, can you handle this knee bend for four seconds? Right. And, and, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're starting to develop the neuromuscular, uh, positioning or pattern of your body, if you will. And 65% of strength is just coordination or that neural pattern. So you want to get that pattern in there and you just keep going back and forth between the stick and then you let them do it. And you can even, you know, we do a lot of filming too. And we go, notice what happened to your body. Film the kid from the side. Notice what happened to your body when you had your stick. Now, what could you do? And I, you know, with young coaches and even a lot of older coaches, when you explain to him, I would rather see a him with a, a Matt Zuccarello long stick, not bending his his knees, than to have it cut off supposedly where is exactly it's supposed to be. So it would have been probably a good idea for me at thirteen to have a little bit longer stick, and you know it it, it took. Really, it was a few months and all of a sudden, okay, I'm, I'm getting my knee bend and my strength back and start cutting the stick back down to where it works for you. And that's a pretty individual thing. I mean, even some of the particular mechanics of a human being, like people go, well, what angle knee bend should I have? And what should the angle be at my hips? And it, it and it's so different. Like if you look at a guy, guys have 
bigger chests and shoulders and upper arms. And that's a lot of weight, right? So if we pitch forward as far as a young girl, which is really a lot of young girls are actually built more for hockey than we are. They have bigger legs compared to their smaller upper bodies. And, and, you know, a, a, a pro will lift weights for, you know, two, three years going into college just to be more like a girl, balance more like a girl, bigger legs, butt, thighs to carry that upper body and have more power to weight ratio. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So it's like, you know, it's a, it, it's kind of a complicated thing. And then you have, you have a guy who's got a really long femur, you know, his upper from his knees to his hips, that's long. He might not have long calves. He might have long femur. Well, he's going to be leaning forward, uh, uh, you know, a little bit more. And if he's balanced, that's where he's supposed to be because of his body geometry. So those angles are, are really, uh, they're really all these, there's little myths that just started because a particular skater was at this angle. So, well, let's tell everybody, you know, he was so good. We should have everybody skate like Pavel Bure. And it's like, well, don't get into the same angles. All you have to do is find out when I'm standing on the flat of my blade and I squat down to, let's say, a 90 degree knee bend and I keep my low back straight, that's your angle. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> and it and it might look a little different with yeah. everybody, right? That is a lot of information. And I think it's very similar to what I experience when I'm in front of players, especially parents of a first lesson. I get this all the time saying, Holy cow, I can't believe how technical this is. <laughs> and and it Yeah, it, yeah, right. It, it's not for you, it's not for your wife, because you guys have been around it so much, and it's not for me either. But Holy cow. I mean, everything you just said, I, I got a mound of stuff that I can go on the same level. And then the same thing happens on the, the, the tactical part of the game. And I mean, it just on and on and on. So there's so much learning. But uh, I want to thank you because I learned something. Uh, I, I was completely no stick at all. But I, I, I like the kind of how you guys rationalized it that yeah i'm going to play hockey i'm bringing all my crap there to the ring because that's what hockey players do and <laughs> yeah but you don't use it all the time and you know that that's kind of the progression um even like when i got into squirts is that any technical skating drill that we did i'd have them drop their sticks and learn it that way first and then when you add the stick, that's another layer of difficulty where it's like they're starting over again. So I I, I like how I like your guys. Sure. I like your guys. Yeah, that's approach. great. Um, the last. Yeah, and for really little kids, it's a it's a, you know the stick is a break from skating, and the skating's a break from the stick, and you know they're they're short a uh, short attention oh, span yeah. theater. Yeah, right? but when you bounce, you know, I think back now, if you're bouncing back and forth, man, it makes the time go by fast, and again. In those early years, it's the the falling down part of it has to be not a negative at all. You know, it, it's just part of the game, and the, yeah. the only time you fail is the when you don't try to get back up and do it again. So sure, yeah, and you, you know, you have a kid just standing there, and you go, okay, let's get down on our hands and knees. Well, they start to find out right away where their padded spots are, right? And, and that's part of, you know, being a little bit more comfortable landing too. You know, you get them on their knees and they kind of, you know, you can just like bash your knees around a little bit because you're walking around. You're like, my wife will actually get on the ice and crawl with kids and it's hilarious. <laughs> it's just funny. Kid will be just crawling across the ice, like on their knuckles. So they know kind of what their gloves do for them, their pads and their, their toes are, you know, the hard toe of a skate and whatever. And they just kind of screw around and you can have them get down on their elbow elbows and feel that and and then they you know try and get up and then get back down and try and get up and then try and get back down and try and get up and then pretty soon it's like okay in between here standing up and down there is not so scary yeah. anymore right yeah and you want to learn to fall a little because it's a lot further fall when you're bigger <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay. exactly exactly if you're really yeah. big nope do nope <laughs> okay uh or be heavily padded uh one thing I want to ask, I can't remember from the last show, just because we had some uh, time in between, but what's your recommendation for skate sharpening? I'm the, we did talk about that, I think, for hollow, that you don't want to have too sharp, sharp of a yeah. skate, but 
just another reminder for everyone, just, you know, a might mom, dad, family, you know, how often should they, you know, sharpen them? What's advice can you give them? Okay, I got a couple things. Okay, so little kids, you know, one of the hardest things for little kids, and we're going beyond where we were before. Now they're going to learn how to stop and they're going to do little things like a snow plow stop or, or one foot is pigeon toed and you're going to try and get them to initiate slide. So we'll kind of just have someone just stand there and kind of scrape their skate to the side to see if who can make enough snow for a yeah. slushy, right? Or a uh, snow cone, that kind of thing. And so they sit there and they're sliding and you'll see kids that they can't get their skate to slide at all, right? They're just like the coordination or the skates are a little too deeply cut for a sharpening. And then what happens is, or the skate is not tied snugly enough, okay? So they're kind of, the skate at the ankle is sort of bent in and they're sort of stuck on their inside edges and they can't get that edge to release. And so, you know, we want to tighten up the skates and get them, get them where they're tight enough, where they're standing, where the base of the, the skate, like if you took the, the steel of the blade and drew a line, it would go right through the ankle, right through the middle of the knee and the hip. Everything's lined up. They're not bent in on one edge or the other. Right. And so you get now, now they're going to have a better chance of maybe uh, being able to release that skate with the added support of the skate to keep it steady. And I, we recommend kids get a really flat sharpening on the day that they're going to stop. So during the summertime, we send an email out to our little, our little people who are just starting that next week, we want everybody to go get at least a three fourths to a seven eighths sharpening, which seems really flat and it is, but it's not what you think. And we'll get into that for the big guys too, but for the little guys, you know, they're going to learn how to stop. Okay. And what will happen is their edges won't catch. They won't, you know, twist an ankle and fall over and then make it even scarier. Their skates will just slide and they'll be able to get into a pigeon toe. And then, you know, you get into this pigeon toe, uh, uh, snow plow type thing. And all you do is lean over onto one side and your body will turn sideways. And all of a sudden now they got a little hockey stop going and you can play red light, green light doing that. And, you know, everybody's got to face the same way and all that kind of stuff. And it gets like that. As far as did you do you want me to go as this progresses through ages? Uh, no, all let's just stop right there and we'll uh, we'll come back to that. Okay. So yeah. let's let's progress on. Um that, that that's really good because yeah. I uh when I started my kids, I just went, you know, to the local shop and just said got a new pair of skates sharp in them and didn't even think about that. So as far as the hollow, that makes perfect sense. Sure. So thank you for that tip. Uh yeah, well, and your kids are pretty coordinated. Not every kid is going to need that, but we have everybody do it because the really coordinated kids are going to find it easier too. Then too, yeah. so it's not a big deal. All right, anyway. so then we're we're still we're still in the the review of the last one, but the, I, I think there's a lot of great points here. So after they uh, they show uh, signs that you know they like going to the rink, the next phase is to sign them up for organized hockey or association hockey uh pond hockey or if you're in a, a colder climate state is a another thing that kids can occupy their time with uh another tip on that if you skate outside on the pond before you go inside you have to get those sharks shop uh, skates sharpened um and then sure and you'll see now as their interest grows in hockey at least on the boys side is that knee hockey becomes even more part of the kid's life uh, and you'll, you'll start to yeah. see that that's a marker, you know, that kids are really into it is how much time they spend with their buddies playing knee hockey or pond hockey and stuff like that. Uh, so they're, they're introduced yes. to, you know, maybe some games, they might have a couple games a month, you know, at the might level cross ice. Uh, it's all so fun right now. And then at the end of the season, um, for the better players, they're going to start getting recruited. And a lot of times what happens is uh, coaches that uh, have a hockey background, you know, like me, uh, introduce my kids to hockey, all right, they like it, what's the next step? I didn't know anything about AAA. So found someone, and that's the next thing that's going to occupy your life a lot in the spring and part of the summer and a little bit of the fall is AAA hockey. 
here in Minnesota, just for everyone that's not here, we play community-based hockey. It's not like this everywhere in the United States. Not anywhere, I don't think. That's on the level that Minnesota is. Not saying that we're better than anyone. We're not. Uh, this is just how we do it. Uh, we play community-based hockey during the winter. And then after that's done, and that's just, you know, kids from your neighborhood and stuff. And then after that, kids are pulled from anywhere. Uh, can be out of state too, but mostly the Twin Cities area. And then there's all kinds of AAA programs. And then you run around doing your tournaments and you get practices and stuff. So for a lot of players that come from smaller associations when they get involved in AAA hockey, that really exposes where you live because uh, my experience AAA hockey, when I uh, get introduced to a player from a small town, you know, after a few years, they would be like, our association hockey is, you know, it's, we can't wait for it to be over because it's so different than what we do in the spring. Um, and a lot of, I think a lot of that is, is just the depth of a lineup. You know, when you're plucking the top kids out of every association yeah. and that's where birth year becomes a big factor too, when they're picking these teams. Um, I read that information. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to start looking for players, <laughs> you know, if a kid's younger, but, but if it's yeah. the same, uh, attributes, size, uh, skill, I'm going to go with the older player. And that's, you know, every coach, I think, does that. Not every coach, but if they know it. They're going to look at it yeah. and see and think about it a little bit. So once you get involved in the AAA, and I don't know how deep you went into it. Uh, my kids played for the Blades. You know, they're one of the top programs here in Minnesota, so it's pretty competitive. But uh, once you start getting into those games, and I think probably getting into squirts, when you're getting into tournaments, that's when, you know, hockey starts getting not, you know, it's, you could say it's goofy, but that's where it gets real. That's where the the ups and downs of the game start exposing themselves. And let me give you an example. You know, you lose a big game. You make a play where you, you, you a goal is scored. Um, the, you don't win the championship game in a tournament. Uh, you have a bad game where you, the team collectively doesn't have the effort and the next practice, everyone's coming in, they're all happy from a great day and you get bag skated. So that's not fun. So you go home and you're not happy. So these, these real life situations start coming into, uh, life is, are, are these called disagreeable experiences? Is that what we call these? Very. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and the, the thing that's kind of neat about tournaments, you know, you, you don't have as many of them in a season and young kids, they don't, they, they, they've not been through a long tunnel to finally see the light of day at the end of a season and win the Stanley cup. They've never been through a long haul like that. So I think it's important, uh, some of those, uh, the, the tournaments on the weekend, you know, it's a three, maybe a four game series of trying to achieve something really big, like the big prize at the end. And so the game means something where, you know, we as coaches think all our games mean something all season long, but young kids don't understand that. You know, they don't understand uh, that, you know, you lose three games and boy, you could be under a rock for a while before you get on top. And are you going to make the playoffs? And they don't understand that. And so that whole little condensed season is turned into a weekend and it means something. And, uh, and I think that's really good for kids to be under that kind of pressure. And to, in today's world, you, you don't have to have that be uh, a soul crushing experience because obviously they have to realize that, that not only, you know, did you lose that championship game, but there's going to be others and we learn from it and there's going to be others. It's not the end of the world. It's just disappointing. And it's, and to, to learn how to deal with it that way and to deal with it with, with information, like these are the things that caused us to lose that game. Uh, maybe the other team was just better. And on, you know, on any, any given night, that team is yep. going to win. Right. But other times, you know, in these things, there, there's some competitive teams. By the time you get up to there, they're going to be really good games usually. And uh, they, they're going to learn a lot from that. And, and I just think I, I think the whole AAA experience is great um, as far as, you know, where do you go? What do you do? 
you want to go where you're going to play. And I think, you know, if I was a young kid and I was going, yeah, you know, Bo, you want to get my son, Bo, uh, you know, played triple A too. And, and if he had the chance to go play for the blades with Lance Pitlick as a coach, that would be where I would want to go. I would want to know, is he going to fit into this roster? Is he going to play? Um, is he never going to see, say, a power play? Because I'd like yeah. him to have that experience. And if he's not good enough to play on that on a on at least a second power play or be on the ice when the chips are down, then I, I don't know that I want him to be on that team as much as I'd like to have him play for you. Uh, you know, the Blades jersey isn't what I'm looking for. I'm looking for where does my kid fit in the best and who yep. is the coach? Like, is the, does this guy know how to develop hockey players? Does he understand? Um, it, or, you know what I'm saying? So those are, those are the things, you know, as far as picking what goes on. And you just really have to continue, I think, even at the, at the might level, talk to the experienced parents who have kids. And don't just talk to one. Talk to lots of them and uh, you'll, you'll start to kind of figure out, I think, common sense way at wise where you should go. Cause you'll hear some crazy stuff and you'll hear some stuff about people. Yes. I want them to have that gray Jersey or I want them to have be in that yellow Jersey of that team because they're so prestigious and the coach is not going to do your son any good. And he's probably not going to play much or maybe, maybe he's way too good for that team. So you when you want to be pushed. So, he, yes. So you're, you're going to be pushed, um, but this is where I think the emotion is introduced to the game. <laughs> you know, when you're going when you're going through these yeah. experiences, and you know, hockey's a game that has to be played with emotion, but it can't play emotional. And you know, kids are have to learn that, like you just said that these hills are going to appear and we deal with them and then we let them go. I mean, you look at a, a call, an NHL right. schedule, 82 games. If you're sitting dwelling on something that happened two games ago, you know, three days later, <laughs> you're, you're going to, yeah. That's so, a snowball. You know, that's where <laughs> us as parents, you know, we got to, we got to, you know, teach our kids to how to get through that, uh, deal with it and then be able to, either put in some extra work to try to make sure that that situation doesn't happen again or that you're going to have the different result. But, uh, yeah, because, I mean, I still I, – I, I've had the experience of it going through it as a player, but, you know, players that I train and my kids, you know, they're going through tough times, and it's hard because a lot of times you, you just don't have an answer that can fix it. You know, they just have to experience it and, you know, right. compartmentalize it and let it go and move on to the, to the next thing. Yeah. I, I love the, uh, you know, the emotion thing too. You know, I had it explained to me by, uh, you know, a really good psych guy that, that your hypothalamus, let's say is your blast furnace. And that's where everything comes from chief, the chief uh, emotion of that is aggression, anger, and aggression, and uh, and and he said you don't suppress those things; you focus them. You focus them into things. It's not like you're playing angry. You know what we think of this angry guy that's slamming his stick down and hurting people and running around, and he's just in a fury. It's focused, so it's under control aggression, and you know my. Uh, nephew plays for uh, Carolina, and I, I love watching Svechnikov because he's this big, strong guy who decided he was going to fight <laughs> Ovechkin when he was a rookie, and it was such a mistake on his part. But what what the the thing about him that I like about him is that you know someone will get a piece of him, and you'll never see him retaliate yet. He focuses, he stays focused and he goes back to the bench and he comes out and scores and he may hit somebody, but he's not going to go chasing somebody around it. It, his, it, his anger gets focused into higher competition. And so those are, those are important. Uh, those are important opportunities for, for parents to teach focus. And, and, and it's not about controlling emotion. It's about focusing a blast furnace. 
it's just, it's, yeah, it's just, oh, I mean, it's not about, it's not about controlling your emotion. It's about focusing all that power into something, uh, into something that, that they want. is productive, you know, yeah. for you and your team. They yeah. want. A quick word from our sponsor, Sniper's Edge Hockey. Sniper's Edge Hockey is your one-stop shop for your at-home hockey training needs on and off the ice. Find the perfect start to your at-home training area with slick tiles, synthetic ice, or a rink liner. Or upgrade your home setup with one of our top quality training tools to help you work on soft hands, all of your deeks and dangles, perfect your one-timer, and improve the power and accuracy of your shot. Find it all online and in stock for immediate shipping at snipersedgehockey.com. So yeah, it's those are great opportunities, and they're and they're it's a cycle that can happen all on a weekend. And I think those kind of small uh, tournament things like that, you know, they're a they're a model for yourself as an adult, aren't they? are they not? You know, as a pro, you know that your season is much longer than the weekend, but you learned all those lessons from some of those ups and downs on those important tournament weekends. Yep, yep, absolutely. Um, I just uh, <laughs> thinking about that that fight with Shret- Svetsnikov. Uh, the one thing he did <laughs> did gain out of that, even though he got KO'd, was instant street cred. <laughs> yes, yes, he did. Uh, yes, he did. So, yeah, hey, uh, his street cred was. Are those uh, Ovechkin's knuckle marks on your forehead? <laughs> That's not a tattoo. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, we talked a little bit about multi-sport athletes, I think, last episode that, you know, I did we talk about it? I can't remember. Yeah, you know, but, yeah, I think so. So, you know, we're we're both like the the multi-sport athlete, like a Paul Martin, you know, that could play college and sure. pro at anything. You know, that's the anomaly. That's not the common. And if you want to give yeah. yourself the best op- opportunity to play college hockey or do, you know, even any sport, Yep. You have to start, you got to start specializing, you know, early teenage years. Uh, and I'm basing that on what happened with my kids. And, and that wasn't my wife or I saying, you're not going to do this. You're focusing just on hockey. They just wanted to do more hockey stuff. The, the older they got, the more they heard from others. And it just became overwhelming. You couldn't do both. Um, Right. So that kind of becomes the the standard and you basically rinse and repeat year after year, trying to get a little better week after week. So we talked about specialized coaching. Uh, now let's get into when we're you've been working with players, you know, a number of years. Um, how what is your approach there? And, you know, how do you keep these kids motivated to keep on wanting to come back to you? you know, regularly to, to put in some extra time. Gosh, that's a, that's a million dollar question for me too. And, and it's just so multifaceted, I guess, because everybody, everybody wants to come to lessons with me for maybe different reasons. Um, Especially if they've been doing it for a long time, the kid is, the kid is, you know, if they've been doing it for quite a while, the kid's probably pretty motivated. I mean, I've had guys like, uh, you know, bring up a, a guy like uh, Gabriel Landeskog, who I knew when he was about 17. I'm in Sweden and working with him. He was a he was a good skater, but he was rough. You know, he was rough. He wasn't a real efficient skater. And, you know, I, I was there for like 10 days and we spent a lot of time on the ice with a whole, there's a group of guys, Hedman was there and uh, Raquel and uh, Lindholm and just a bunch of guys like the Elias Lindholm, a bunch of guys like that. And they, they were all really good athletes and really intent and really uh, studious while we were there and brave. They would try anything and they would push it. And, and then I never saw them. I never didn't see him again until the year he got drafted and he was a much better skater. And so he was a guy who he was able to adapt to what I had to teach him like freakishly fast. Okay. He's an anomaly. So I, I just like to start with a, a bookend. Right. And then there's the other guys who I've had that have, you know, they skated with me. I had a guy, uh, in, in Minnesota here that started skating with me when he was about, I think he was seven or eight years old. 
And he played for, I believe, 12 years in the NHL. And I saw him every year. I, I mean, there was a point where I only saw him in the summers, probably once high school started, I only saw him in the summers, but I saw him every year. Yeah. And he was a guy that was like, listen, I don't really feel like I can uh, go a summer without continually staying sharp. You know, it's kind of like, even Roger Federer had a service, a, a, a coach, you know, someone to, uh, you know, a, a third party, if you will, um, just continually watching for excellence in his game. Now, this particular guy loved that. I mean, his favorite, he just, I think he would have made a good figure skater. He just loved skating. And so there's another end of the spectrum, too. Um, and it wasn't like he was a bad athlete or anything, but he wasn't a great athlete either. I would say that his A plus skating in the end was a, was a, uh, it, it wasn't necessarily a, a product of me. I helped guide him through it, but he went through it. Like he got the repetition to the point where that skill became autonomous. And it just, it, it was like him just riding around on his legs. All he had to do is hang onto the puck and look around. His, his skating was going to be there for him. And I think, um, you know, he got a lot of accolades for that too. And so he never wanted that to go away. So it's just, there's, there's so many reasons why uh, people skate for years and, and what their motivation is. Um, but the truth is, you better be able to skate. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I have, I, I've had some guys, uh, you know, really prominent, well-known. I don't like to use names unless uh, unless it's really important. But a really prominent, well-known guy who was Captain America, and uh, you know, he 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 did really well, and and not a good skater, right? And he had a chance. He, he had a chance. He came and skated with me once, and he had. Uh, he had, he, he was like, Oh yeah, this is cool. We would did this sprinting thing that everybody wants to do. And so I, we did this sprinting thing and we took like 20% off of sprint time His high top end speed and Im improved over 20%. Wow. And then it's like, Hey, you can come and, uh, you can come and skate, uh, you know, all summer we'll learn all kinds of things. You'll get, uh, you'll get really efficient. He's like, Oh God, I could never do that. I have this skating coach since I was a little kid and it would be like divorcing my mom. Mm -hmm. So it's like, so there's, there's those kinds of things too, where people, they, they, they just, there's things that are too powerful for them and they get in the way. And, and so, yeah, there's, there's so many different ways that people have gotten involved in skating. And, and I think the vast majority of them is I need to learn how to skate. I need to be better. I like these repetitions. Uh, I challenge them emotionally, you know, to, to, um, you know, to break through the things that are kind of hard, you know, we're, we're made to go uphill, not downhill. Yeah. Right. And, and we find meaning going uphill and we get stronger going uphill and everything works going uphill, but sometimes it just burns. Yeah. Right. And so I, I think that's a, I, I think I end up maybe being a piece of the puzzle for that forum a little bit. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not sure if I'm answering oh. your question right or not. There is no, there is no right answer. And the one thing that I, yeah. the one thing that I would have, you know, they pretty, pretty much verbatim, I could say the same thing. The one thing that I would add is that I, I have players that I worked with heavy early. They had some success. Uh, then all of a sudden I didn't see him for a while. And yeah, then, yeah. and then all of a sudden their dream, their goal is now not eight years, seven years away. It's two years away and the, the clock right. starts ticking and they see that, holy crap, I can't make up those years. Uh, so yes. then they start coming back and I, I'm the first one to tell them, you know, I'm just going to be honest, you're fighting the clock now. Um, yeah. So anyways, um, the one thing I, and that's a hard, that's a hard thing for kids. Like kids are like, they get better than everybody else young because they are training and they're getting the reps and all that kind of stuff. And they don't realize that eventually they're not playing with those kids anymore. They're playing with the other kids that are getting the reps and they're, and it's going to be, they're going to be challenged and they got to keep going. 
And, and I think that's the point kind of that you're making too. You, you gave up on what gave you success and you could have had and would have had more and steady increase, right? Oh yeah. And I think that, you know, there's a misconception. I mean, I fall into the trap all the time that if you put in enough work over enough time that you're going to reach the the paradise where it becomes easy and you don't, you know, but, and it's yeah. not, yeah. The, the process does not change from the start to the end. You know, if you have right. success, the more success you have, the, the tighter your schedule has to become, the more disciplined you have to be. And the, the more stuff that gets added to your plate, because if you want to compete with people at that level, you got to do what, what everyone else is doing. And that's everything that's available. Exactly. So um, right, right. I wanted to go over, you know, we talked about specialized coaching and training, you know, so for you, it's an introduction, but now we're talking about when they're older and their uh, teenage years as they're preparing to maybe uh, go for the college and stuff. But we got a technical skating specialist. I wrote down on ice stick skill specialist, off ice stick uh, skill specialist, vision training, strength and conditioning coaches, uh, sports psychologists, mindfulness coaches, nutritionists, uh, physical therapists, athletic trainers, chiropractors, doctors, video analysis coach. Um, <laughs> many of you out there. And you've used them all. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I paid for them all. <laughs> right, right, exactly, uh, exactly. And many of you out there may be thinking, there is no way I'll use all those people on top of all the games and practices my kid's going to have. But eventually, if you're if they hang around long enough, you, you probably will use all of them and more. Um, so yes. one thing that's an extra that's been around, I did it uh, as part of my summer training, uh, was treadmill skating. Did we talk about that last yep. episode? No, uh -uh. I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. That's a that's an interesting thing, okay? Because I have, I have, uh, I I mean, I I see benefits and I also see downfalls, mm -hmm. right? Like the whole the the modern the modern skater now is what's called a glide platform skater, meaning the fastest skaters. Like it, like I think we talked about power skating and how yep. no one had ever produced a power skater that could skate faster than they could run. And, and very few, I think the number is one in, well, that used to be two in 300, but it's one in 150 or whatever that followed the power skating model and the overspeed training and bought all those things. Um, that one out of 150 would hit their running speed and everybody else would be slightly slower to quite a bit slower than their running speed. And nobody had ever accelerated to the 10 meter point, which is goal line to about a meter past the top of the circle, uh, a 10 meter uh, point. Nobody had ever uh, beat their running speed to that, to that point. Yeah. And, Nobody accelerated past that point to a higher speed. Wow. So they were hitting their higher speed there. And no matter how much they tried skating right at a laser and a uh, radar, they could not go any faster. In fact, the harder they tried, sometimes they slowed down. It was crazy. Wow. And then now that people are on glide, they're able to hit like Connor McDavid can run. I think it's like 23 miles an hour, but he can skate 29. Uh, uh, Dylan Larkin can run. 24 miles an hour and he's been clocked over 30 miles an hour. So it's a different style of skating. It's staying on glide. It's similar to being on a bike and, and changing gears and, and you could be pedaling the exact same speed, pushing the same amount and you just keep shifting gears and you're going faster, faster and faster because there's nothing stopping. You're not digging your toe into the ice and having your foot just fly back. Like you took it off the pedal to push on the ground to go faster, right? You're, you're staying on your glide platform. And that's why we talk about posture and why the sticks can't be too short and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff so that we can achieve this kind of thing. And so when, and what you're doing is you're trying to achieve it on a crushable surface. It's something that can just you get you get as strong as you were as a pro and the way the pros are now um just the physics behind how hard they can drive their body uh you know this the weight 
on their skate, going into a corner and ripping a turn. That's a lot of force on the exact same ice that they were skating on as a 10 year old when they weighed 57 pounds, right? And so what happens is you have to be so well balanced over the glide platform of your blade or you're going to just rip into the ice and slow yourself down. Just imagine a heel turn, right? You're just driving your heels into the ice. You can actually stop yourself if you want to. And there are ways of doing a power turn and gaining 30% speed with just a power wow. turn. And, and that's glide platform. So that's how skaters are. They're so much more efficient now. And you have to be able to pull that off. And the, the treadmill is a plastic surface. So you can make a lot of pushing mistakes, the articulation of your actual blades on the ice. You can make a lot of mistakes on that. And then one of the other things is it's a ramp. So it, it's facing uphill. So you do pitch yourself over forward in into a position that doesn't translate to the ice. And if you get too much repetition, I've had guys that have done that and they get back out on the ice and I have to rebuild their, their ability to sprint. Yeah. And so I don't call it like it used to be called acceleration something. And now I, and I used to call it, you mean, keep up. Like you're not taking off from zero with a correct technique. You're already speeding up and they might ramp it up as you're going, but there's no instant acceleration type stuff that you can do on it. So those are the downfalls for it. The, the upside to it is um, I think, I think you can show kids some aggression on it. Ooh. Like the kids can, yeah. the kids can, uh, you know, they can kind of learn some of the things that they didn't know they had in them as far as effort goes. Like I had this girl this morning who is, you know, she first got out there uh, not too many weeks ago, beginning of the fall. And she got out there, never done it before. And she goes, God, I don't understand what you're talking about. And she did it. And now, and she was with veteran students, you know, she was kind of the straggler and the thing. And I think she's about, she's about 13, maybe going on 14. And now she is my model student in that group. And I just went up to her today and I said, I said, I love your mind, what you've done with, with how you've approached this. You've never stopped. You kept moving. You kept doing it, got better and all that. And I said, what kind of hockey player are you? And she goes, uh, she goes, Oh, I don't know. I guess I'm average. And I go, so you need to grow some teeth. Right. <laughs> and she looked at and she, she looked at me and, and kind of smiled like she knew exactly what I was talking about. And I think, you know, for her, I'd put her on one of those things and just crank that thing up to 75 <laughs> and tell her to keep up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, so it's like, it's so like, I think, I think that's good. And then another downfall is all it is is forward stride. Okay, so um, if you look at the SAP chips that are in the back of all the jerseys and everything, and I'm not sure if we talked about this last time, they get so much information, time on ice, speed. They can pick up how much pressure is on your skate when you make a power turn. How do you figure that out? Well, it's the pixels. They fly around a pickle at a, at a certain speed. They know how much the guy is, uh, weighs, and they can tell this is how much force he's handling. Isn't that it crazy? Is and then you can also tell how many crossovers this guy does. And they have, I, I met Hasso Plotner. He owns the Sharks and he's the guy, he's the head of uh, SAP. He's got this massive room of people just counting stuff. <laughs> just wow. like all the metrics you hear. It's like, what? He does, Connor McDavid does 10 times more crossovers than the average NHLer. No way. Not 10 times more than a peewee. 10 times more than the average NHL. Totally. It's crazy, wow. right? And so, and he does, ten, and they're both 10s, 10 times less forward stride. It's not important to him at all. Wow. And so consequently, because he's weaving all the time to get speed, you know, takes off with crossovers into a, into a, you know, maybe a half loop and he's just wheeling around. He's so deceptive that he's, blowing people away at 18 miles an hour and he can skate 29. So he's skating down the ice. He's weaving around. Nobody knows where he's going. So they just back up. And all of a sudden the defenseman's like, Hey, I'm at the blue line. I got to cut this gap down. And he speeds up to 20 and the guy's going 14. And it looks like Connor McDavid is the fastest guy in the world. And it's like, he's the fastest player because he's so deceptive. 
and and it's crossovers it's crossovers it's crossovers it's crossovers you're right yeah. and it's it's your ability to do the footwork and nhl players turn around from forward to backward uh, like a uh, forward to backward 10 times more than high school players wow isn't that crazy yeah. just because of the puck protection you know catching bad passes being able to face, you know, you don't want to throw a backhand all the way across the ice. So you may actually turn backward to fire a hard forehand, right? right? So it's like, it's all that kind of stuff. So I, I think while you just have to know what it is you're getting into when you get onto a ramp, it's like, it's like a screw, let's say. We need screws to build the house, but we also need nails and hammers and saws and ladders and cranes and cement trucks and workers and blah, blah, blah. So I think you just have to know what you're getting into. And if you're like you're if you're already a good skater, it probably isn't gonna screw you up. And so you watch these really good skaters that use them and oh yeah, I do this and blah, blah, blah. And then you get a bad skater on there and it just makes them worse. So I hate to make enemies with that thing. I just want people to know exactly what it is. And that's what I've seen. You know, it, it, I just exactly yep. what it is. And, and so from the standpoint of aggression, it's awesome. And what I'll say is that, you know, I, that was part of my summer routine for pretty much my whole professional career. And a guy that had just enough skill to make it into the NHL I did the treadmill all the time, so it worked for me. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, for uh, sure. One thing I'll add is that you know I had Dick Bra as uh, the trainer. Oh yeah, so, so you know how to skate. So you know, uh, think about who's running you. You know, same thing about when you're picking a AAA team. Uh, if you have options, you know, go where the love is, go where the the experience and the where long term development is the priority, and uh, yeah. you're gonna be good. Okay, so. We are this chipping along, you know, this thing starts out as a curiosity, becomes a passion <laughs> and then a, a pursuit. So I asked you before we jumped on, I didn't give you a ton of time, but uh, just to kind of wrap this up, what words would you use to describe your most successful hockey players, both male and female, because I know they're exactly the same. So we're just going to go back and forth. You're going to mention a word and then say something about it. And then I'll mention one. Why don't you start? Uh, driven. Yeah. Do you got anything to say about it? Uh, they, they are, they are now in a place where they probably ask dad. Yeah. <laughs> and you're, you're different because you were there. Okay, but but for I think most of our listeners listeners that you know didn't get to the top of the mountain that way, you know they're going to pass their parents up at a at a at maybe a younger age, and they're 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 becoming autonomous with their ability to continue to get better, and they start to look for they they start to look on their own. Uh, where did you learn how to do that? Where did you get that stick? What do you do? Why are you tying your skates? Why do you tape your skate like your stick like that? And they just compile information. They're so hungry. You can't give them enough. Yes. They're very driven that way. Yes. Uh, I would say habits over time. They, uh, establish very, uh, uh rock solid habits. Uh, discipline would be another one. We'll put those two disciplined habits where they, they have a daily schedule. Uh, they don't go into a day not knowing what they're going to do. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. I mean, think about, think about all the times you're like, I got to work out tomorrow. And then you ate terrible and your workout is hell. Yeah. It's just hell. And it's like, yeah, you wonder how do you have the discipline to eat like that? It's like, well, do what I do off the ice and try and eat bad. Right. <laughs> it doesn't work out, especially if you're driven to be a player. Right. That's where it comes from. It's that it's not just you want to be successful. It's like, man, you hate failing like that. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, that's that's the thing. Uh, it becomes more than just the skill acquisition. You know, it's. Sure. Nutrition is a, is a big part of it. So 
uh, and getting, you know, your, your, your habits, getting those, uh, dialed in, going to bed at the right time. Um, yeah, you got the next one. Yeah. And I think it would be, I think it would be along the lines of sort of what I just said. They just fear losing. They fear losing in the weight room. They fear losing, uh, you know, the, the food battle. How do I, how should I eat? They just do not want to, they don't want to lose. They don't want to lose. Uh, they don't want to lose the little stick handling drill we're doing to warm up at the beginning of the practice. They don't want to, they don't want to not score in the goalie warm up drills. They just fear missing their mark. They just fear it. And it just drives them. They make a mistake. And, uh, you know, because they're, they're focused, you're going to see the, the, anger build up and then it subsides and turns into a, a, a Porsche. It, the guy turns into a Porsche all of a sudden, he, you know, he, he blew up a little bit, made a, made a, made a mistake and blew up a little bit and just turns it on. Cause he hates that. He hates when it doesn't go right. Yeah. And it, and it's uh and it goes right along with uh, what the, the psychologists say when they took, and I don't know if we said this last time, they take the thousand questions to a thousand elite athletes and uh, elite people who have achieved, and they ask them basically to come down to 10 different answers. And one of them is, is are you motivated to win or are you motivated by not losing or fear of losing? And it's fear of losing hands down over anything. Yeah. They all say, I just hate not, I hate being inadequate. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's like that. Totally, I guess I would put it there. Yeah, totally yeah. agree. Uh, next, I would say virtuous. Uh, just good people I get to get in front of every week that, uh, you know, are kind uh, and they treat people, you know, I guess how I'd like to be treated. Uh, would you agree on that? Dad, I, I think I think you hit on the best one. I, I, I that's that's one of the things that that I, I think it's really the key to everything because I don't think you learn any of those other things we talked about without seeking the truth that way. You know, like what's the right thing to do? What's the right way to be? You know, how to how to be a good person and pursue things in the right way. Yeah. I don't think you can actually learn those other things. So I think, I think that is the pinnacle one. I think you've nailed it. You got another one? Oh man. So it's going to have to be second best then. Huh? Well, you know, we're just throwing uh, it out another there. one would be, yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I, and I, and there are, there are people that uh, I, I would say, um, you know, they, they're kind of words that start playing off of some of the other things we said, like, like, they always want to overcome. Like I have guys that were not gifted. Okay. They were not gifted skaters and they, they repped it out to the point where, uh, you know, they, to make that, you know, like uh, to make that, that skill kind of an autonomous skill, they repped it out enough to make it to the NHL and make a great living with a good career. And they will say, no way could I have played had I not changed my skating as much as I did. Yeah. There's no way. Yeah. And I, and I've seen that. I've seen that when I'm working with a pro team, you know, you spend a lot of time with the rookies and they're like, dude, you got to learn how to skate. Yeah. And they don't believe you at first until they see somebody who is, you know, he's been out there doing the, we have these little routines that guys will go through and you'll see someone doing the routines and lo and behold, you know, six months later or that next year, that dude changed his skating. Like Teddy Bluger is like that. He played at uh, Minnesota state down in Mankato and uh, plays for the Penguins and he was struggling uh, getting out of the HL, and they're like, "You can't skate." And and I started seeing him. He got uh, recommended to come here, and and uh, he's from Latvia. And he came here, and he spent the summer uh, learning how to skate. And they got back up, and they're like, "Oh wow, Teddy, that's pretty good." And then he came back, and then the second year just cemented it. And we're talking twenty two lessons in the summer. And then 22 the next summer. And now they actually talk about him at that. His, his skating is one of his strengths. Wow. And it was the thing that was keeping him from being there. And he was just an exceptionally virtuous guy yeah. <laughs> to put it that way. He's the nicest guy. 
um, just keeps his nose to the grindstone and just keeps working on it, kept working on it. I never really ever saw him get frustrated. He seemed to understand what it was he was supposed to do and he'd struggle with it. And I would keep telling him, Hey, do this, you know, get you get your head up, get your, uh, you know, straighten your back out. Uh, you're digging your toe in, blah, blah, all these little things. And he would just immediately kind of like, even after the drill was over, he'd be over in there and you could see him sort of moving in motions that I was talking about. He's just constantly trying to do it, just creating these new, a new neuron engine that he was not born with. Yeah. All right, we got to wrap this up. I'm going to just go through. Yeah. So a few other ones, uh, they're curious people, and they are mega learners. They, they want, show me how to reach. Show me, you know, struggle, uh, which in turn uh, gives them confidence, a return on their investment for this extra training. And all of this yeah. is because of one word, and that's action that they take consistently day after day, week after week. Now, it might not always be on the ice or physical training, but they're putting time into uh, getting better every day. Uh, the other one that I would think competes for the number one spot is humility. Um, mm -hmm. They know they're good. They don't have to tell anyone. I always tell parents, um, if you got a kid that's really good, <laughs> When they win, say little. When they lose, say less. <laughs> You've heard that before, probably. Yes, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that's great. So I like. I I completely agree. That's that's awesome. That's good insight. Yeah. So you can't go wrong with humility. And uh, the game is funny because when you think that you're bigger than the game, the game has a way of taking it away from you. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe getting injured or uh humbling you <laughs> by maybe yeah you exactly. know being a healthy scratch or you know something like that um but some of those experiences you know are for for you know you didn't do anything wrong you're a healthy scratch because you're you're part of a team and someone trying to manage a team and you're not one of their top guys and again roadblocks but one thing that popped into my head as we wrap this up is uh I like talking to you <laughs> and I, and I think that there is a lot of value that, you know, people out there listening can grab to it. And, you know, maybe we do a reoccurring thing where it's uh, ask coach Barry and ask coach Lance and people write in their questions and I'll compile a list and we'll just go back and forth and try to answer them the best that we can. That would be so much fun. <laughs> no, I love this. You know, every time, every time you call, I have to think quick before I answer the phone. Do I have anything going on for 45 minutes at least? <laughs> Cause you know, something will come up and we'll just start going at it. I love yeah. it. That's good stuff. Well, the one thing I'll add to is that uh, the, the players that we work with the longest and have the most success is that they never seem to have a finish line. Uh, when they get to, to one spot, they just start the path uh, to the next one. Um, yep, they go from chewing on one bone to the next right yeah. away. So thank, There's no rest. thank you, sir. Uh, this is going to be coming out Christmas Day. So Merry Christmas oh, very to nice. you and your – or not Christmas Day, the day uh, – the 21st, I think it is. It's going to be on the 21st. But uh, thank you so much for your insight. Love the conversation. Uh, I want to have Jody on the show. I want to get her side of the story because I'm sure it's going to be a little different than yours. <laughs> yes, definitely. So thank you, Barry. Thanks, Lance. Merry Christmas to you. Well, that concludes part two of How to Build an Elite Hockey Player with Barry Karn. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed this segment. And if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It would really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon. And do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.